Uh, hello, everyone. Happy Earth Day, uh, and welcome to the fourth session uh, of the third annual Arbor Day Conference webinar series uh, hosted by the Rice Creek Field Station and the Canal Forest Restoration Project. Uh, my name is Robert Salerno, uh, and I am the Canal Forest Restoration Project intern, and I'm joined by Dr. Kristen Haynes, uh, who is the Assistant Director of the Field Station, uh, as well as one of the directors for the Canal Forest Restoration Project. Uh, we're very happy to see you all here today, especially with all of the other hustle and bustle with Earth Day festivities on campus. Uh, and I'm just as happy uh, to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Douglas Talamy, who is a New York Times bestselling author, as well as a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. Uh, there, he teaches many insect-related courses and leads research in insect ecology, biodiversity, and plant insect interactions. He's published many books, including Bringing Nature Home and The Living Landscape. And today he'll be talking about his most recent publication, uh, The Nature of Oaks, uh, which really ties beautifully into the Canal Forest Restoration Project's mission um, and goals, and is really a great advocate uh, for our program. Uh, in this book, he talks about how important these native trees are uh, to our ecosystem and the great amount of biodiversity um, they're able to sustain. He is also the co-founder of Homegrown National Park, uh, a movement to encourage homeowners, farmers, and land managers uh, to restore biodiversity and ecosystem function uh, by removing invasive species and planting native trees. Um, and so before Dr. Talmay begins, uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, if you're not the person speaking, please remember to mute yourself. Um, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, or just hold on to them and ask them during the Q&A session, which will be about 10 minutes at the end um, of the webinar. Uh, we will be recording these talks and they, a couple, our first two are posted onto YouTube. Um, this one and the third talk will hopefully, hopefully be posted uh, within the next few weeks uh, to watch at your leisure. Um, and don't forget, we have another talk, uh, the last one of our Arbor Day webinar series on April 29th. Um, talk with a climate change forester from uh, the DEC, the New York DEC. Um, and I think that is all I have to say. Uh, so I'll stop talking now and pass the spotlight over to Dr. Talamy. All right, thanks, Robert. Um, there's no time to lose because we got a lot to talk about uh, in terms of oaks. I'm gonna focus on the nature that is associated with oaks, a little bit less on oaks themselves, but the things that use and need oaks. And I'm gonna start my story in uh, July 2000. This is our house. This is where we moved in a farm that was uh, broken up into 10 acre lots. It had been mowed for hay uh, and very old farms. So there, were, there was very little biodiversity there. And our goal was to restore it. Uh, well, we moved in in July and that September, end of September, October, a couple of white oaks down the street, about a mile and a half down the street, dropped their acorns. So we gathered up a bunch of those acorns and we planted them all over the property. And this is what white oaks do in the, the fall. They germinate, they send down a root, a radical, and that's all they do. They just sit there the rest of the winter. And then in the spring, they send up their first leaves and that's all they do in the spring. That's all they do that summer. And it gives the, the press, impression that oaks grow very slowly. But in fact, they are growing rapidly. They're just doing it underground. During the first year, oaks grow 10 times more root biomass than leaf biomass. So here's our little oak. We're gonna follow what's happening on this, this oak. Here it is in the the following year after we planted it. Uh, it's got a little deer cage around it because we certainly have a lot of deer and they love oaks. 18 years later, this is what that oak uh, looked like. 45 feet tall, 47 inch circumference, a canopy spread of 30 feet. It's still a baby, of course, but it's a real landscape tree and it didn't take all that long. Uh, one of the points I want to stress today is that oaks really are a lifeline to an awful lot of species. There are dozens of bird species that depend on oaks. A lot of, of mammals, including the big ones like bears that will live in the hollow centers of large oaks or spend the winter there. Um, not that many reptiles depend on oaks, but there are several butterfly species that specialize on them and hundreds of species of moths depend on oaks as well as their predators and their parasitoids. So a lot of diversity there. We've got sinipid gall wasps associated with oaks. We've got mini beetles, June beetles, longhorn beetles, metallic wood boring beetles, weevils. And then uh, if you, if you uh, look beneath the oak, you find lots of spiders and, and arthropods and mollusks and annelids, um, all kinds of things happening in oak leaf litter. So it's a very diverse community uh, that's associated with oaks. The problem is it goes unnoticed. 
And if it's unnoticed by people who have oaks in their yards, it is unappreciated. And that's why I wrote the book, The Nature of Oaks. It is a month by month guide to the life that is occurring on your oaks. You can go out and you can see what I say is, is going to be there uh, in June or July and see if that's actually happening. And the reason I did that is because I wanted to provide the knowledge that uh, hopefully would generate interest. And then interest often leads to compassion. And we need a lot more compassion towards the natural world these days. First, a few facts. The genus Quercus contains 91 species in North America, 435 species globally. So in terms of a, a deciduous species or a deciduous genus, it's a large one. Quercus comes from the Celtic quer, meaning fine, and quez, meaning tree. <clears throat> so oaks really are fine trees. There are four taxonomic sections in, in North America. In the genus, the, what we call the white oak group is called Quercus. The red oak group is Lobati. The live oak group, which are more southern, uh, Verentes, and a much smaller canyon oak group, Protobalanus, in the west. This is the uh, distribution of oaks. There's at least one species of oak every place uh, except the brown. Those are areas where oaks don't naturally occur. But the center of distribution in uh, North America is down here in the southeast. Although in Mexico, there are at least 250 species of, of oaks. So that's really where the center is. Oaks live a lot longer than people think. Uh, average life cycle of 900 years. Uh, so 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis, and 300 years of decline. And during each one of those periods of growth, they're delivering unique ecosystem services. Uh, now, a lot of people say, well, my oak didn't live that long. And that's true. It's because we do a lot of things that shorten oak life, lifespan. Uh, most important, we, we often chop off their root systems. Their root systems can be huge and they bump into a road or a cellar or a pipeline or something. Uh, and that uh, causes problems. What's the oldest oak in the country? Well, people argue about it. There's an oak in uh, California called the Pachinka oak. It's a coastal live oak. It's estimated to be 2,000 years old. There's the angel oak uh, down south, 1,500 years old. Um, so they're, they're scattered around. But the true champion is uh, a palmer oak, which doesn't look like an oak at all. It's more like a ground cover. Uh, it is a true oak, but it creeps along the ground, roots itself, then dies, but roots over here and just keeps going. This specimen has been estimated at 13,000 years old. So it, it uh, really uh, beats any of the others handily. Uh, this was the Y oak in Y, Maryland. It was the largest white oak in the country. And it gives you the idea that they can get huge. Uh, it fell over in a hurricane, mm, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. I did get to see it before uh, we lost it, but not all oaks are, are huge. Uh, and and uh, one of the points I, I want to make very briefly today is that there are small species that we can put in our yards, even when they are small. What I really want to focus on, though, is, is their superior ecological value or ecological function. They have the highest biodiversity value, meaning they're supporting more species than uh, other, other tree genera. They're sequestering carbon better than most, most uh, other trees, pulling carbon uh, dioxide out of the atmosphere and locking it up in their tissues and then pumping the carbon into the ground. That's a major contribution because once the carbon is in the, in the soil, turning it brown or black. It's very stable. It can stay there thousands of years <clears throat> out of harm's way. Uh, they're one of the best soil stabilizers because of those big root systems. They make the best leaf litter, meaning it lasts the longest. And all of that promotes healthier watersheds. So I started the book in October. Everybody wants to know why I chose October because that's, that's when my wife said, you should write a book about oaks. So I said, okay, I looked out the window and there's our oak in October. And of course, October is when those acorns start falling. They've been on the tree for a couple of months, but we don't usually recognize them. Uh, and an oak can make a lot of acorns, up to 3 million acorns in its lifetime. And each one of those is a really uh, important packet of food for many animals. It's very rich in fats, very rich in proteins, uh, and a number of rodents depend on uh, acorns, but so do the big guys. So do bears and lots of other mammals like squirrels, like those cute deer that we all love. But many birds depend on acorns, particularly turkeys. They will scour the, scour the woods all fall long, eating every acorn they can find. Um, red belly woodpeckers, titmice, towhees, believe it or not, nuthatches, flickers, lots of things are eating acorns. Many ducks, particularly wood ducks, 
an acorn that falls into the water, the wood duck dies down and gets it, and they come up on the land, uh, land and they just eat acorn after acorn. Lots of invertebrates depend on acorns as well. This is the acorn weevil. Uh, the larva is, is uh, tunneling out of an acorn, and that is what the adult looks like. They can be really common in acorns. And a similar uh, group, this is acorn moths, where the caterpillar is in the acorn it developing, and then it comes out uh, and looks like that. So with all these things eating acorns, uh, a week or two after the acorns drop, you look under the tree, it's utter destruction. All the acorns are smashed or eaten or taken away. And you might wonder how oaks ever successfully reproduce. And that's when a very ancient mutualism between jays and oaks. Jay, the jay lineage all over the world actually has a very close association with oaks all over the world. They both evolved in Southeast Asia about 65 million years ago. Uh, and uh, it is a mutualism. Jays get food from oaks, and what they deliver to oaks is the ability to move, to disperse. And this is how that works. Jays will store that food in the form of acorns uh, for, for winter use. They want to eat them in the wintertime, so they'll, they'll take an acorn, um, and they, they bury them singly. They don't cache them, so they're not making a pile of acorns uh, in one place. They bury them singly. They pick one up, fly up to a mile from the parent tree. Uh, and that, that is the key because nothing else moves acorns that far from the parent tree. And then they'll tap it below the surface of the soil, typically in an area where the soil has been loosened. Now, if they think another jay has watched them do that, uh, they will wait a few minutes, then they'll dig, it, dig the acorn up and move it because jays know that jays steal acorns. Then during the winter, they're gonna go back and eat the acorn. So they can bury up to 4,500 acorns each fall. They, meaning one single jay, can bury that many acorns. They're working very hard at it, but they only remember where one out of every four acorns is. So a single jay can actually plant 3,360 oak trees every year. And if they do it a mile from the tree, that's what allows oaks to disperse farther and faster than any other tree genus in the world. It's not just blue jays doing that. We have seven or eight species of jays in this country, uh, and they're all doing that. This is a, a jay in um, Oregon I took a picture of. So they all have a close association with acorns. And so do acorn woodpeckers, entirely different birds in the Southwest. Uh, and they're doing similar things in that they're storing acorns for winter use, but they don't store them underground. They find a tree, a snag that's dead, and they drill holes in it, and then they store the acorns in the holes. Uh, so they just stick them in there and uh, that's a great place to store them. But they can store a lot of acorns in an acorn tree, up to 50,000 holes are drilled there. And that becomes a very valuable resource because they don't want to do that every year. So families of acorn woodpeckers will guard their egg acorn trees from other acorn woodpeckers. And if, uh, if you happen to have an acorn tree in your yard. It's enormously entertaining. Okay, November, uh, you might have uh, think back and say, well, this was a good year for acorns, or it was a terrible year for acorns. Uh, and that's typically what we have. We have a lot of acorns or very few, which is an unusual way for trees to reproduce. Uh, so uh, ecologists have looked into it. When they make a lot of acorns, they, it's a mast year. It's called a mast event. Uh, and um, Again, that's so unusual compared to the way most other trees reproduce that there are a number of hypotheses to explain why oaks mast. One of them is predator satiation, predator reduction, improved pollination and energy partitioning. So let's look at each one of those. Predator satiation. Um, the acorn weevils, as, as I uh, said, can be really common in acorns. They can be inside 90% of the, the acorns. Uh, and so can acorn moths and, and those rodents and all the things that eat acorns. If oaks made the same number of acorns every year, the population of the things that eat acorns would stabilize around that number. Uh, and they'd eat all the acorns. So it'd be very hard for the oaks to actually reproduce. But if you make a variable number of acorns, so a whole bunch one year, the population of acorn weevils and acorn moths and squirrels and everything will explode. You have a lot of acorn eaters. And then the next year you make almost none. And maybe the next two or three or four years you make almost none. Then the population of acorn eaters crashes. So that's called predator reduction. And then you have a mass year again. 
um, and and there's not enough predators around acorn predators around to eat all the acorns. So that's predator satiation. Um, so masting reduces the the uh, size of the populations of things that depend on acorns, uh, and then swamps that that uh, population size so that there are viable acorns left. Improved pollination, acorns or uh, oaks are wind pollinated which is a game of chance. You release your pollen on the wind and hope that it finds a female flower. These are male catkins. And if everybody's doing that at once, uh, then the chances that uh, pollen will actually find the female flower is increased. And then finally, energy allocation. And by the way, if you're wondering whether oaks can have good fall color, this is a scarlet oak in my front yard. They can indeed have good fall color. So energy allocation, there's never enough energy to go around. So oaks partition it. They'll either use it for reproduction and make a lot of acorns and very little growth, or they will grow a lot that year and make very, very few acorns. Uh, so those are four hypotheses. They are not mutually exclusive. They all could be explaining uh, oak masting at the same time. December is when you might realize that oaks are, are exhibiting another curious behavior. Uh, and that is, it's a deciduous tree, but they don't drop their leaves, at least uh, in the, it's very common in the white oak group, they're hanging onto their leaves. It's called marcescence. So they'll hang onto the leaves right through the winter time. Uh, again, very curious, why are they doing that? Well, the leading hypothesis is that it, it uh, wasn't that long ago when we had a lot of very large uh, Pleistocene mammals roaming, not just North America, but all of Eurasia and even down, even in South America. This is the group of mammals that were in Mexico alone. So these are three species of mammoths, the giant sloth that could reach up 18 feet. Um, these were big guys. And many of them were browsers, meaning uh, they're eating, uh, they're not eating the grass in, in your front yard. They're eating the uh, woody twigs on woody plants, primarily the buds. That's where all the nutrition is. So if oaks surround those buds with dead leaves from the previous year, it makes a mouthful um, around the bud a very untasty event. So, uh, and it'd be difficult to get the bud without getting a mouthful of leaves. And the distribution of marcescent leaves supports that. Um, they're low. When you get up about 18 feet above that, there are no marcescent leaves and that's as high as those, those uh, big mammals could reach. So very difficult to prove this hypothesis, but it makes a nice story anyway. It also gives oaks a landscaping trait that uh, other trees don't have. You can use them as a screen even in the winter time. So if you don't like your neighbor, you want to screen them out, you can plant a white oak and it will be an effective screen all year round. Okay, January, uh, it's cold and we don't spend a lot of time out looking up in our oaks, but if we did, uh, we might see little birds hopping around. Uh, things like chickadees and titmice and, and uh, golden crown kinglets. Now chickadees and titmice, they're at our feeders eating seeds and, and it's, so it's, you know, maybe they're just playing up there. But these guys, golden crown kinglets are insectivores. They don't eat seeds. They should have migrated. Uh, and they're tiny birds, they're smaller than a, a chickadee. So they need a lot of food to make it through the winter, but they didn't migrate. And that forms the kinglet paradox. What is a bird that depends on insects doing in the cold parts of the country where there aren't enough insects? Well, Bern Heinrich uh, is a great naturalist, writes a column for the uh, Natural History Magazine every month. Uh, and he doesn't like paradoxes. So he actually looked in the crops of golden crown kinglets to see what they were eating in Maine in January. And he found they were filled with caterpillars. Caterpillars just like this that sit on oak branches. And a lot of them look like sticks. They're in the family geometry for the most part, um, the inchworms, and they are looking very much like sticks. So there's, there's one right there. When it gets cold, they've got antifreeze proteins in their cells to keep the cells from, from bursting. Uh, and, and they shrink a little bit. And then when it gets above freezing, they swell a little bit, but they just sit there all winter long. So we don't have a kinglet paradox anymore. There's plenty of food up, up in the trees. Uh, and that's what those little birds are doing. They're, they're actually hunting for food. The next question is, what are the caterpillars doing up there? These are almost full grown, not quite, but almost full grown. Uh, and you know, it's, it's unusual. Most insects overwinter as eggs, or they overwinter as pupae, uh, or as, as uh, adults. Uh, and in each case, what we think is happening, of course, in the spring, the, the buds burst forth and you've got young leaves. 
those caterpillars can outcompete anything else. If you overwinter as an egg, what hatches out is a tiny little thing, and then can't compete with those big caterpillars. If you overwinter as an adult, you've got to find a mate, mate, and then lay eggs, and then the eggs hatch. Uh, the same thing with a, a chrysalis, you've got to emerge as adult and then find them. Then. So uh, it gives uh, the caterpillars that do make it through the winter a competitive advantage, and they've got an endless supply of food in the spring. They'll complete their development and then emerge as moths. Okay, February. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna more or less skip this month. I usually talk about oak landscaping mist. Then it's the quietest time of year for oaks uh, uh, biologically. So um, there are a lot of myths surrounding the use of oaks in as landscape plants. Uh, and again, we're, in the interest of time, we don't have time to go into each one of these. So let me just tell you the answers. Are oaks too expensive to use? Well, they are if you insist on planting a big oak. So don't do it, plant a tiny oak, and then you get a much healthier oak, one where the root system has never been compromised. It'll be much healthier and grow faster, much faster than the big tree that you spent $3,000 on that has no roots. Oaks grow too slowly to use as landscape plants. No, they don't. Uh, they grow slowly the first couple of years building that big root system, and then they grow as fast as anything else. And I can document that. Um, oaks are too big to use in small lots. Uh, you know, they can be, um, nobody's going to recommend you use a big oak on a small lot, but we do have small oaks that we can use in, in this part of the world, particularly the dwarf chestnut oak, Quercus prinoides, makes acorns when it's five feet tall. So they are available. You don't have to plant the giant ones. Oaks are going to fall over and crush your house. Um, again, it's not just oaks, anything will, when you plant it as a specimen tree. Um, so what we're recommending now is that you plant a couple trees close together again, far closer than anybody else would recommend so that they lock their roots together. That's the way trees grow in forests. They grow with their roots interlocked and they're far more stable. So when the big winds and the rains come, they don't fall over. And finally, oaks are going to lift up your hardscape, your sidewalk, your driveway. It depends on what you plant them over. If you plant them over bedrock, Yes, their roots will go laterally and they'll lift up anything. But if you plant them with a, a decent amount of, of uh, soil, uh, the roots go deeper and easily underneath that, that uh, hardscape. So there you go, landscape myths. March, this is when those leaves finally start to fall. Um, no more marcescence and create leaf litter on the ground. So let's talk about oak leaves once they fall. First of all, there's a lot of variation in oak leaves and the shape of oak leaves. Um, tremendous amount of variation. A lot of people think all oaks have lobe leaves, but look, they don't. That's a live oak from the south. This is an emery oak from Arizona. Looks like a holly. This is a willow oak. Looks like a willow. That's a water oak. Uh, these are the traditional oaks we, we know in the, the northeast. So red oaks. Uh, juvenile leaves are bigger than adult leaves. So it's, it's fascinating to think about all the variation in, in oak leaves. They make a lot of leaves too. So a big oak tree can uh, have 700,000 leaves on it every year. And when they fall, if you line them up next to each other, they would cover four tennis courts. And that is their job, to cover the ground. When we talk about oak leaf litter, uh, somebody suggested we should call it um, leaf largesse because it's delivering so many important resources to soil communities. First of all, it protects the soil communities by keeping the moisture in. Everything that lives in the soil needs high humidity, high moisture levels. Uh, so when we rake all the leaves away, we're exposing the, the soil to the bare sun and uh, it, it, uh, it actually kills the soil community, including all the fungi, the mycorrhizal associations, not good. Bare soil is not good. It also returns the nutrients to the soil. Most of the things that live in the soil are detritivores. They are eating the dead leaves and turning over the nutrients so the tree has something to turn to, to take up the next year. It's another reason our oaks don't live as long as they should because we rake away the leaves every single year and essentially starve them. And if you fertilize them artificially, you never get it right. So it is much better to have the leaves uh, disintegrate and return the nutrients to the soil. There are more species uh, that live in the soil than above ground. So it's a, it's a vibrant community. All of them are small, uh, but that doesn't mean they're not important. A lot of people worry if they leave the leaf litter on the ground that the plants won't be able to get through. This is a natural uh, fern, fern, I'm not gonna call it a planting because nobody planted them, coming right through the oak leaf litter, no problem at all. Our plants are much better at getting through leaf litter than um, we think they are. I mean, after all, who was raking the leaves before we came along and the plants all seem to make it. If you scrape away 
Well, if you look at the amount of leaf, uh, amount of life in one square meter of uh, the top layer of soil under an oak tree, you're going to find a lot of things. 250,000 mites, 100,000 springtails, columbulins like the sminthura here, 90,000 proturans. Those are tiny, uh, very primitive insects. You need a microscope to see them. A million nematodes all in one square meter. So it's a vibrant community and they are returning the nutrients to the soil. Uh, there are a number of butterflies that actually uh, specialize on oak leaf litter after it has dropped from the tree. And the banded hair streak is one of them. That's what the adult looks like. Uh, pretty common. We run into that. And this is what they eat. Um, I've never found a, a larva yet because they look just like the leaves, but they are down there. Unless you rake it away, then you're raking away the banded hair streak. You're raking away 70 species of litter moths that where caterpillars eat the leaves. Things like the ambiguous litter moth, the American idea, the dark spotted palthus, and 67 other species. When you see your towhees or white throated sparrows or other things, it looks like they're hopping in the leaves. They're pushing leaves backwards with their hind legs. They're exposing the larvae uh, of these guys, and, and that's what they're living off of. So you're, you're, you're throwing away a big source of food when you get rid of your leaves. And there's a lot of predators that are down there. All the ground beaters live down there, and a lot of spiders and centipedes and other things, millipedes. Uh, living in that leaf litter, including lightning bugs. You know, everybody's like, where are the lightning bugs go? I don't see them the way I did when I was, I was young. Well, how much leaf litter do you have around? This is what an adult lightning bug, it's not a bug at all, it's a beetle. Um, and that's what the larva looks like. It is a predator in leaf litter, where it's eating snails and worms and, and other arthropods. When we get rid of the leaf litter with the high humidity, we are destroying the, the um, habitat that supports our lightning bugs. Okay, April is when the, uh, the leaves just start to, to burst forth. Um, so we're almost at the end of April yet, a little late this year. We don't have any bud break yet, but it is the time of year when you have uh, a chance to see one of the most ephemeral interactions in all of nature. Could happen this Saturday when it warms up. Uh, it takes about five minutes a year, so you have to be looking at the right time, but I'm talking about when sinipid gall wasps insert their eggs into the buds of, of oak trees. Uh, so this is a female gall wasp and that's her ovipositor. She's laying an egg in that bud. And here's a male that is riding her. He's already mated with her. So the egg she's inserting will be fathered by this guy. But after she lays this egg, she's gonna go lay another one in another bud. And he wants to be the guy that's gonna father it. And this is a male who wishes he was this male. So not only is she inserting an egg into the bud when, uh, uh, when you see her doing this. She's also inserting plant hormones that control the growth of that gall. It's actually a compromise between what the sinipid gall wasp wants and what the oak wants. And it turns out to form a species specific structure that we call a gall. People say, oh, it's like a cancerous growth. It's not like a cancerous growth because cancerous growths are uncontrolled growth. Galls are highly controlled uh, growth. And again, they're species specific and recognize the species of galler by the shape of the gall. This is one that I saw uh, ovipositing last spring in one of my oak buds. I tagged the bud after she did it and that's the gall that resulted uh, from that oviposition event. There are a lot of gallers out there, 5,000 species of snippet gallers worldwide um, on oaks. A single oak tree can have 70 different species of, of galls on it. And many of them are hollow. This is the apple oak gall or the oak apple gall. You, you see it written both ways. If you cut it open, the gall is right in the middle there in a very hard disc. And then you got a lot of air in the outside of the gall. What's that all about? Well, it turns out that snippet gallers have more parasitoids, more natural enemies, other wasps, with very long ovipositors, that's how they deliver the egg, that lay their eggs in the larvae of sinipids. Um, more parasitoids than any other type of, of insect. So the gall is one of the, one of the ways that the sinipids protect themselves. If they have a big hollow space between where the galler is and the outside of the gall, uh, it's, it's, when it's finished growing, it's bigger than the largest ovipositor of its local natural enemies. This is a pterymid wasp. That's pretty long, but it's not long enough to reach the center of that, that apple oak gall. In the beginning, when the gall is growing, they can reach it, and that's when they have a chance to, uh, to lay their egg, but the rest of the time, the galler is protected. Uh, 
This is a uh, pteromid wasp from California with the longest ovipositor. And that long ovipositor has uh, created the evolution of the largest gall that we have in this country. Um, it's got to be big enough so that the center of the gall is, is uh, farther enough away that that ovipositor can't reach it. A lot of variation in gall uh, size and, and structure. Many of them look like plant diseases, uh, but they're not. There are 536 species of plant galls west of the Rockies, and uh, most of them are cynipids on oaks. So some lay the, the uh, make the galls on leaves, others make the galls on stems. Um, the Western galls are really fantastic. Some of them look like, like candies. There's actually, whoops, come back here. There's a galler in each one of these, these uh, little, little nungies here, except for one, one's empty. Uh, and unless I have that around, they're all empty except for one. And the, the uh, pterymid wasps that are trying to find the galler can't tell which one it is. So it's a game of chance. You've got a one in six chance of avoiding the parasitoid. Some look like that. Some look like, really do look like diseases. Spindle galls, more candy. This is a, it looks like pottery. It's in my yard. This is the cutest one of all. The, uh, it's the mushroom gall, but I, I think it's the little gnome house gall. In the West, a brain gall. Here's an interesting one where you have four galls on a single leaf, but look at the number of gallers that came out of each one of those galls. So that single leaf made hundreds of cynipid gall wasps. And galls uh, have played an important role in the history of, of uh, we humans. If you grind up a gall like this and combine it with particular chemicals, it makes an indelible black ink. And that is the ink that human history has been recorded with. The Bible was written with gall ink. The Magna Carta was written with gall ink. The Declaration of Independence was written with gall ink. All of the, the writings of the monks and scribes in the Middle Ages were written with, with gall ink. Uh, so without galls, who knows? Maybe we never would have learned to read. Okay, May is when those leaves uh, really burst forth. Uh, the new biological year starts in earnest uh, because throughout, not just on, on oaks, but of course throughout North America, we have big leaf expansion. And following that leaf expansion comes the caterpillars that eat those leaves. And following those caterpillars comes the birds that eat those caterpillars. It is no coincidence that our migrating birds are migrating up when there's a lot of caterpillar food to eat. Remember the birds have not made, you know, the plants have not made seeds or berries yet in the spring. So the migrating birds are depending entirely on insects, primarily caterpillars. And birders know that if you wanna see warblers, you go to oaks because that's where most of the food is. And I had a, a student, uh, Christy Beal years ago, actually measured warbler foraging in uh, different trees in cemeteries. This is by tree family, but the first one here is Phagaceae, where the oaks are, oaks, beaches, and chestnuts, but there were no beaches and chestnuts in her study. Uh, so you, that's it. That's where the warblers are. These are pines. These are birches. A little bit here because there's a little bit of food, but most of it is focused on the oaks. Again, we're talking about caterpillar food, things like the purple crested slug, the buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, the double line prominent, the uh, white dotted prominent the checkered fringe prominent, the laugher, the lace cap caterpillar, the two-spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the banded tussock moth, the red line panapoda, the yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa, the unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug, they're called slugs because the heads are tucked up underneath, not because they're really slugs. The streak dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the spun glass, I mean the uh, um, spiny oak slug, and there's the spun glass slug, which is my favorite, the prettiest caterpillar in all of the country, I think, and hundreds more species are on the oaks in this area of the country. I've been taking pictures of every species of, of caterpillar that are found at, in our yard. This is what it looks like now because we put the plants back. I'm up to 1,140 species of just moths that have been attracted to the plants we've put back in our yard. So restoration works and 30% of them use the oaks that are in our yard. And that's why we've got 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres because we've got so much bird food, all of those caterpillars. 
Um, I call oaks keystone species because they're making more caterpillars than any other tree in North America. Remember what a keystone is. There's the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take it out of the arch, the arch falls down. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants make 90% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs and nothing does it better than oaks. Oaks are sporting over 950 caterpillar species nationwide. Again, no other plant genus comes close to that. Why do we need so many caterpillars? Uh, well, they drive our, our food webs. Caterpillars are delivering more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. Uh, so for example, if I'm a chickadee, I'm gonna raise my young, I need 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, depending on the number of chicks in, in my nest, just to get them to the point where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, the um, the parents continue to feed the babies for another 21 days. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees. And the plants we typically landscape with, the calorie pear and the, the crepe myrtle and the ginkgo, they don't make any caterpillars. So we need the oaks to provide all that food so we have successful food webs. Okay, June, June is cicada month. Um, we had periodical cicada emergence this year. I don't believe you did up there. Uh, in the north, but uh, we had the 17 year brood uh, come out. So let's briefly look at, at what happened. Um, of course, the media got a hold of it and they, they paint it as very negative. It's going to be a terrible scourge and, and uh, you know, it's, they're going to be so loud that it'll drive you crazy and you'll kill your babies and it's an invasion. Everything was negative about it, but it's actually the most fantastic biological event you will ever be privileged to witness. And it was a big one. This is what... Uh, those are the shed skins in front of one of the oaks at the University of Delaware. And when they emerge, they are aerating the soil. Uh, they've been underground eating uh, xylem from uh, tree roots for 17 years. Uh, but now they've, they've tunneled out. The uh, hole is there so oxygen and water can get down to the roots. It's very healthy for the trees. It was a big one uh, this year in Newark, Delaware. So big that 11 Mississippi kites flew up to eat the cicadas that were in Newark, Delaware. I don't know where they came from, but um, that was very entertaining. So here's the basic life cycle. The, uh, the nymph crawls out and hangs from a branch at night because they're very vulnerable. And then they split the skin, they hang down, swing up and, and tan their, their uh, exoskeleton. Their, their, it's, this is like a soft shelled crab right now. Anything can eat it. So that's why they do it at night and nothing can see them. And in a few hours, they're all dark and ready to go. So here's a male, he's going to sing. Uh, he vibrates a, a uh, structure in his thorax uh, called a tympanum. It's like a, a clicking Coke can. Click, 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 click. But he does it about 400 times a second. And that's what creates the buzz. And he does that to attract a female. And females are attracted to the male that is buzzing the loudest uh, because that's a measure of male quality. Uh, so he succeeded. He, he attracted this female. Now it's her turn. She's going to lay eggs in tree twigs and they do love oaks. So here's her ovipositor. She's jamming it into a pin oak uh, branch in my front yard. Try that. Get a, get a pin and try to stick it into a branch. You're going to bend the pin because it's really hard. But somehow she does it. She jams it all the way in there. And then she lays an egg and then another egg and another egg. Uh, and then she'll go to another branch and do the same thing. And from the point where she lays the egg on out, the branch uh, dies. That's called um, oak flagging or flagging from, from the cicadas. And people get upset. Oh, it's going to kill my tree. It's not gonna kill your tree. It happens once every 17 years. It's just nature's pruners. Uh, then the eggs hatch, little guys fall to the ground and they, they tunnel underground and start to suck on plant roots. A tree can have 50,000 cicada nymphs on the roots without any measurable um, impact on the growth of the tree. And that's because xylem is mostly water. They can, they can eat uh, xylem with very little effect on, on the tree. Where are they going to lay their eggs? I had a student look at where the flagging was in Newark, Delaware, and these green bars are types of oaks. So they definitely did prefer oaks, although they'll, they'll choose other trees as well. And then they die. And everybody wonders, what are they doing underground 17 years? 
the best explanation, again, is that predator satiation. There is no predator population that can track cicadas and wait 17 years for the next emergence. So there are lots of things that eat cicadas, but none of the populations are big enough to eat all the cicadas that come out once every 17 years. July, July is when the night chorus starts. And by night chorus, I'm talking about cicadas. I mean, Katie did. Katie did. This is the male Katie did. It lifts its, its wings up and rubs them back and forth on a scraper and file and makes a characteristic species specific sound. Uh, I did a lot of camping in North Jersey uh, when I was growing up and uh, Katie did sang me to sleep uh, many, many a night. Why are they singing? Well, this is why. Once upon a time, there was a young woman named Katie who fell in love with a handsome young man. Alas, he did not share her feelings and he married another. Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the trees were watching that night. And each summer, they solved the mystery by singing, Katie did, Katie did. If you're anywhere near an eastern deciduous forest in the summertime, I'm sure you have heard that sound. There are four species of katydids that frequent our oak forest in the east. This is what a female looks like just before she matures. Her wings haven't expanded yet, but there's her ovipositor ready to go. And here she is with her wings fully expanded. Uh, why are the katydids so loud? Same reason. The females are choosing the male that sings the loudest because he's the highest quality male. She'll lay her eggs uh, and she glues them to the edges of twigs. These guys have already hatched, but sometimes people find these big flat eggs and wonder what they are. They'll start singing uh, mid-July, sing all the way through August and into September, uh, and depending on when you get the first frost. Um, so they're singing a good part of the summer. August is when um, it's very hard for caterpillars to eat oak leaves because oak leaves toughen up. As soon as they emerge or expand, they start to add lignans and tannins to the leaf. And, and by August, they can be tough as boards. But caterpillars get around that by eating gregariously. The, a whole bunch of mouths here can, can get through that tough leaf litter, leaf material better than a single mouth. That's the yellow neck caterpillar. Here it is when it's big eating oak leaves. But Gregarious feeding is very common in oaks. This is the um, orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm. They're all feeding gregariously. I walked around our oak, the one we're following in 2014, and just in the lower branches counted 410 caterpillars. 115 of them were yellow neck caterpillars. And then I stood back and took this picture so I can ask you, do you see any of the caterpillars on that tree? No, you don't. Do you see any of the caterpillar damage? No, you don't. And this is the distance at which we view our trees. But if I knocked on your door and said, oh, you got 410 caterpillars just on the lower branches, most people would grab the spray can, spin, save the tree. You don't have to save the tree. Oaks are sharing their energy and that's why we have life in our yards. It's a normal thing. Uh, there's a woman in, in uh, New Orleans, Tammany Baumgarten, who suggests that we all take the 10, use the, uh, practice the 10 step program. Take 10 steps back from your trees and all of your insect problems disappear. And I think that's great advice. Another way to avoid uh, the leaf toughness in August is to become a leaf miner. Just eat the center of the, the leaf material. So the toughness is on the, the outer edges. But to do that, you have to be very small and very thin. This is uh, a serpentine leaf mine made by a caterpillar, a little leaf miner. Egg was laid here, and then it ate and ate and ate. The black line is its frass, its poops. Uh, and then it pupated here. So it doesn't eat very much material. Uh, this is a blotched leaf mine. There's the caterpillar right in there. Here it is backlit. And here it is uh, with a very nice picture from Salvador Vitanza. So they don't look much like caterpillars uh, when they're uh, leaf miners because they've got all those specialized adaptations to be a leaf miner. But when they come out as a moth, they do look like moths. They're tiny, but they look like moths. This is one of the Camomaria species on oaks, the solitary oak leaf miner, the gregarious oak leaf miner, the oak tentiform leaf miner, lot of species of leaf miners on oaks. September, our final month, uh, is when you, you start to recognize uh, crickets. They're starting to sing, those black guys on the ground. If they get in our house, that's, it's good luck when they're singing. But there are bush and tree crickets uh, that are not black, they're green uh, or, or yellow. Uh, and they're doing the same thing. The males are going to sing in order to attract females and the louder they are, 
the more females they will attract, but they're very smart about it. So here's a male who wants to be louder than he really is. So he finds a hole in the leaf. He sticks his head through there, raises his, his wings and starts to move them back and forth and make his characteristic chirping sound. Most leaves are parabolic in shape and that projects the, the um, sound farther and louder from the leaf than if he were singing on a flat surface. So he's actually sending a false message to the female. He says, I'm, I'm a high quality male when maybe he's, he's not. If you can imagine a male sending a false message to a female, it is hard to believe. But maybe it's not a false message because he might not be the loudest male, but he could be the smartest male. It's also the time of year you might are most likely to see a walking stick. Uh, I took this picture on an emery oak in Arizona because um, we don't see them that much in the east here. They're up in the canopy most of the year. Uh, they're called walking sticks because they look like sticks and they walk. And they have a curious uh, uh, egg laying behavior. They just walk along the, the uh, canopy and drop eggs to the ground. Some will hatch that year, others will hatch uh, the next year, and sometimes they even wait three years. But there's a curious relationship with spring ephemeral plants. This is bloodroot. It makes a little pod here if it's fertilized. I mean, if it's pollinated, that pod splits open, makes attractive seeds with a white structure on them called an eliasome. And ants love eliasomes. They will pick up these seeds, carry them back to the nest, eat the eliasome, and then throw the seed into the garbage dump of the ant nest. And that's a perfect place for this seed to germinate. Well, uh, walking stick eggs kind of look like that. Uh, they're about the same size. They've got a white structure here. It looks like a, an eliasome. And I bet they smell like eliasomes too. And the ants pick them up, take them back to the nest, put them in the garbage dump because they can't eat them. And that's a perfect safe place for these walking stick eggs to hatch. All right, we have made it through the year. Uh, so I'm going to end by uh, reminding you that we humans have created two major crises on planet, planet Earth certainly have a, a uh, climate change crisis, but we also have a biodiversity crisis. And it's important to note that if we had no climate change crisis, we would still have a biodiversity crisis because we have not shared the, the planet with other living things. We talk about the loss of biodiversity. We have, we have lost uh, 3 billion birds in the last 50 years, 3 billion breeding birds, and they say have disappeared. We've got global insect decline. The World Wildlife Fund says we've, we've lost two thirds of our wildlife. They've all disappeared. They haven't disappeared, we've killed them. I mean, we're actively, when you remove habitat, you're, you're killing this, all of these organisms. And that's why we're in the sixth great extinction event that the earth has ever experienced. Good news is, even though it's a global crisis, it does have a solution. It is a grassroots solution. It's one that you and I, everybody can address all on our own. There are four things every single landscape has to do today. And, and one of them is capture carbon, pull the carbon out of the atmosphere. When we sequester carbon in plants, we're addressing both the biodiversity issue and the climate change issue. We have to manage watersheds. Every landscape has to support a diverse community of pollinators and every landscape has to support a diverse community, a very, very complex food web. That's the, the, the food web that drives our ecosystems. When you plant an oak, you're addressing three of those four major ecological goals better than if you planted any other tree. You're capturing more carbon, you're managing the watershed better, you're supporting a more complex food web. The only thing you're not doing better than other trees is supporting diverse pollinator community because oaks are wind pollinated. But three out of four is pretty good. Despite those wonderful landscape attributes, oaks are in trouble today. The old giants are gone. We cut them down right away because uh, they were either in the way of, of our farming or uh, they just had a lot of wood associated with them. The percentage of oaks in eastern forests has been cut in half in the last century uh, for several reasons. We have suppressed fire, uh, which those ground fires uh, encouraged uh, oak, oak uh, dominance. We've also introduced a lot of, of problems, things like the gypsy moth, which is now the spongy moth, by the way, um, and several oak diseases, uh, oak leaf scorch, uh, oak wilt. Out west, we've got uh, sudden oak death syndrome. They're hammering our oaks. We've got habitat fragmentation that has, has uh, the oaks are now so separated in many places that the pollen doesn't reach the female flowers. So acorn set is small. Because of all those reasons, 28 of our 91 North American oak species are now threatened, and a third of the global oak species are endangered. 
The Oregon white oak, Quercus gariana, has lost 97% of its range. Used to grow from central California all the way up through Washington state, 97% gone. There are 2,300 species that rely on oaks in Great Britain that are now threatened because of the loss of oaks in Great Britain. And I could give you statistics like that all around the temperate zone. We humans live our lives out in a very brief instant of ecological time, and we can't return those giant uh, oak trees to the forest in that time, but we can start the process. And in no time at all, the oaks that we plant today or the oaks that we planted yesterday uh, will be big enough to fulfill their keystone roles in our landscapes. Everybody on the planet is responsible for good earth stewardship because everybody on the planet requires good earth stewardship. We all depend on the quality of our local ecosystems. And the best way to exercise your responsibility towards earth stewardship is to embrace the power of oaks. So for the sake of our turkeys, our chickadees, our woodpeckers, our warblers, our jays, our thrushes, our lightning bugs, our gallers, our weevils, our orthopterans, us, for our own sake, plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Talamy. Um, that was really fascinating and interesting. Um, we have time now for questions from our, our audience. Um, if there's two ways to do that. If you want to unmute yourself, you are welcome to um, unmute yourself and ask a question, or you could sub submit one in the chat. Um, okay, we have one from um, Eric Helquist saying, you know, thank you for speaking to us. Um, do you have any thoughts on how deer populations are impacting oak regeneration in the Northeast? I should put that in the slide. Deer are a major problem for oaks. Uh, they're a major problem for most of our native plants that are trying to regenerate and, and, and uh, recruitment into our forest. Uh, there's so many problems associated with deer. Every baby oak tree that pops up, if a deer finds it, it will eat it. And that is, that is true for native plants in general. And the deer don't eat the non-native invasives. So that is what has, has pushed many of these uh, non-native plants into an invasive category is because of the deer have changed the competitive balance. Our native plants are, are, are quite competitive, but not if a deer eats them when they're two inches tall. So um, deer over overabundance, and it was just it was just measured in North Jersey recently. Uh, it's 14 times over the carrying capacity. Um, a lot of deer. Uh, and we all know this. We all know it's bad. We've got Lyme disease. We've got all kinds of problems. But so far, it's it's a social problem. We are we are have refused to actually deal with it. But um, uh, deer are hammering the oaks. Yes. Uh, thanks for that question. Okay, I have a short question. Um, uh, those insects which um, eat. The seeds, um, are they killing the seeds, uh, the laurel? Right, um, usually no. So if you have one acorn weevil or one acorn moth and an acorn, it can still germinate. And uh, you know it won't be as, as much energy as if there was nothing in there. But sometimes you have two or three in the acorn and that usually would kill it. But a single one often doesn't. And of course, if a jay eats an acorn with an acorn weevil larva in there, it gets extra protein. So it's, but actually it would have to eat it right away because the acorn weevil larva will exit the acorn way before the winter and it won't be there anymore, so. <laughs> Can I speak up? Go okay. ahead. Can you hear me? Uh, I uh, wonder if you have any particular uh, ideas about uh, the canal areas of waterways where the trees, like in our area up at, in uh, the Erie and Oswego canals, uh, are so, uh, the oaks were, uh, particularly the white oaks, because of their waterproof uh, type of wood, 
uh, were literally wiped out. And I think that even the small trees, uh, in my theory, is were, were taken for pilings and things. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the uh, idea that would have on the ecology of uh, animals, birds, as, as a kind of a big barrier area where the waterways were. The loss of oaks anywhere is very hard on biodiversity. Uh, and it is an awfully, we were very lucky that we had oaks pretty well distributed when the chestnut bite came and took out the chestnuts because chestnuts were major drivers of biodiversity from Maine all the way to Georgia. And if we didn't have oaks with the acorns they produce, we would have lost an awful lot of mammals and, and birds. Uh, so when you lose both the chestnuts and the oaks in, a, in an area, it's, it's very hard. But remember, uh, we took the oaks away, we can put them back. Uh, people often say we're, we're gardening the world, and we really are. We're managing land pretty much everywhere. So we know that oaks are very powerful ecologically. We can restore them, but we have to do it. Thank you mm -hmm. for a wonderful presentation. And uh, I want to mention that uh, we uh, also had, uh, I now live in a, a Collington uh, uh, retirement center in Maryland. Uh, and they put your presentation on our uh, TV uh, pro program uh, yesterday. So, and it was excellent too. Yep, thank you very much. <laughs> Any other questions? Actually, there's five in the chat here. I see one. How about gypsy moths? Our oaks are filled with egg masses. Yeah. Well, when I say we need caterpillars, I don't mean we need, we need caterpillars from someplace else. Those are invasive species. They're here without their natural enemies. They cause huge problems. Um, so, uh, you, you know, if, you, if, a, if a gypsy moth, and, and it really is called the spongy moth now, it's politically correct. Um, if it defoliates your oak two or three years in a row, it can kill the oak. And we don't, we don't want to lose the oaks. If you spray for gypsy moth, you just spell, spray Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, it will kill the, the caterpillars, but it will also kill all the other caterpillars too. So you're taking your oak out of, of production for that year. So it's a judgment call. Um, you know, when we have a cool wet spring, and so far that's what we have had, and gypsy moths hatch out, there's a fungus that actually uh, will, will control them. So if you don't have to spray, don't. But, um, but sometimes we do have to. So, you, you know, you have to, it's, it, it is a jump, uh, judgment call. The best thing is, of course, not to bring these guys over to begin with. Uh, what else do we have? Wants to know if this is recorded. This is recorded, right? Yes, I see it's recording. So. Yes. Yeah, we'll have this on our um, on our YouTube page and our website probably within a week or two. Yep. Um, Dr. Talamy, I, I have a question in terms of, you know, do you have specific, you know, what do you recommend people plant in terms of species? Like, do you recommend, you know, plant plant a bunch of different species that would be native to your area? Do you focus on any in particular? Um, yes, if you have the space, I would, eh, again, it's a judgment call. Remember, they are, they are wind pollinated. So if you only have one member of a species with nothing close to it, it will never produce any acorns. They won't self pollinate. Uh, so you need enough to, so that you can get healthy uh, you know, pollination. On the other hand, if you have enough space where you can have more than one species, that's good too. And I would vary between the white oak group and the red oak group. Uh, but you know, oaks, we've got 91 species and they grow in all kinds of situations. So if you live in a wet area, I would choose a, a pin oak, that's an oak of the swamp or, or uh, uh, 
swamp white oak or, or swamp chestnut oak, uh, rather than put them up as street trees, then they're stressed. If you live, if you've got high rocky soil, very thin soil, white oaks do well there, chestnut oaks do well there. Some oaks like basic soil, some oaks like uh, acidic soil. So figure out what you have and then choose the oak that's appropriate for that. But the more species you can get in there when there's at least, I would say, I don't know, at least two individuals, but three would be even better. That's, that would be ideal. Wonderful. Um, well, we've come to the top of the hour. So I, you know, virtually um, round of applause for Dr. Talamy for this uh, fascinating talk. We, we very much appreciate you spending part of your Earth Day with us. And thanks to everyone who tuned in to spend part of their Earth Day with us. If anyone on this call is interested in getting their hands on a, a small native oak that they can plant in their landscape, um, our project does give them away for free to the public. We grow them from seeds. Um, actually, George and Jane on the talk here were the founders of our project. Um, we will be giving trees away for the first time this year at the Arbor Day um, kind of rededication ceremony at our college's Arboretum next Friday at 3 p.m. at the Centennial Arboretum on campus. So stop by and you can grab a tree if you have been inspired by this. We would also encourage anybody. Um, here is Dr. Talamy's beautiful book. Um, the River's End Bookstore in Oswego is a great place to go. You can stop in to order it or you can order it online and even get it delivered to your home from there. Um, so if you like this talk, we do encourage you to pick up a copy. Um, again, next week we have Brian Ellis, who's a climate change forester um, with the New York State DEC as our final Arbor Day webinar series speaker. Um, thank you all for being here. Happy, uh, you know, Arbor Month, I suppose, and uh, happy Earth Day. And thank you again. <laughs>